Hello, everyone, and welcome to When Communities Lead, Environmental Justice Through Participatory Flood Risk Management. My name is Alev Bilgensoy, and I'm a planner with the San Francisco District Flood Risk Management Program. My pronouns are she, her. I'm going to use a best practice that we learned during November's Disability Justice Webinar and provide you a visual description of myself as well. I have olive skin and dark brown hair. I'm wearing a beige turtleneck, and I'm sitting in front of a teal painted wall. I'd like to turn it over to my co-conspirator, collaborator, co-producer of the webinar series, Jessica Ludi, to introduce herself as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Ludi. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am uh, sitting in a room with a white background and a bookshelf, and I have olive skin, long, dark brown hair, which I'm wearing at my side, and a white and navy blue striped shirt. Thanks, Liv. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, while this webinar took place uh, on March 3rd, we are re-recording re re this introduction in April. We had some issues getting the recording started during the original webinar time, uh, so we will introduce our speakers and then we'll segue into the original recording. I'd like to take a moment to quickly thank everyone who was a part of making this webinar possible. Thank you to Carlos Moran, Dr. Daniel Rivera, and Dr. Marcus Hendricks for joining us today and sharing their time and their expertise. We'd like to thank the National Flood Risk Management Program. Thank you to the team of volunteers from our district office who helped provide closed captioning. Because of them, we are able to provide a more accessible webinar experience to you all. Uh, thank you to Tammy Reed from our Public Affairs Office. And finally, thank you to you all for joining us today. Now let's jump into why we're all here. There is a substantial disparity in flood risk between wealthy, homeowning, and predominantly white communities and low income and communities of color, people with disabilities, people in the LGBTQIA2 spirit community, non-native English speakers, and others. We also know that these groups are not often equal recipients in the economic, social, and environmental benefits of our flood re resilient systems and recovery programs. The Bridging the Equity Gap webinar series seeks to understand the scale and the complexity of systemic inequities in, flood risk, in the flood risk management cycle. Each webinar identifies opportunities to change our practices, our procedures, organizations, and policies that may inadvertently perpetuate inequality and take actions, small and large, that can improve flood risk management, community cohesion, economic opportunity, and self-reliance for vulnerable and historically marginalized communities. Each panelist in this series is being asked for actions we can all take to make these changes. So you're sure to come away with a to-do list every time. To put today's discussion into context, let's revisit the framework introduced by Damaris Villalobos in the August webinar, where she summed up the factors that reinforce inequities in flood resilience. Going from left to right, historical practices and policies like housing or disaster response policies have created a baseline level of inequity across all people and communities. It's an uneven playing field, if you will. We learned during the September webinar that social vulnerability is not inherent to individuals, but is due to external social, economic, and political factors sometimes compounded over generations. Moving to one more or er, to the right once more, because modern practice and policy are built on top of an inequitable foundation. Resources today are not distributed equitably, meaning they are not going to where they're needed most. In a previous webinar, Dr. Junia Howells explained that flood response and recovery programs increase the wealth of white, college-educated, and or home-owning people while costing people of color, renters, or people without college degrees. Moving to the right once again, historically marginalized people and communities are not well represented in either the flood resilience workforce or in the process of flood risk management decision making. Last month, our excellent panelists discussed the increasing workforce, that increasing workforce diversity and representation is one way to include and elevate a range of lived experiences in our work. All of this le leads us to increasing in inequity and vulnerability. Today, we will be talking about the third factor of the in the equation and how participatory planning is a tool for bridging the equity gap and delivering environmental justice benefits to historically excluded or marginalized communities and people. 
So we really quickly want to plug some of our upcoming webinars um, in this series. Um, we're looking forward to uh, discussions around equity and relocation um, and looking at kind of metrics and quantification and benefits of or and alternatives to the benefit cost analysis. Um, and we hope to see you all there. All right, so today we are very excited to speak to three practitioners coming to the discussion from a broad set of perspectives and lived, lived experiences, and we think you'll really enjoy it. Um, without anything further, let's hear from them. In this case, in our original recording, we had our panelists introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to read their bios that they sent us um, since we don't have that in original intro. So. Um, Carlos Moran, um, with an ex advanced, advanced degrees in social work, Carlos Moran's experiences include designing and implementing high impact strategies that intersect mental health, public health, and environmental justice. Carlos regularly engages diverse ranges of communities to advance place based solutions that drive large scale multi benefit investments in Los Angeles' most economically, environmentally, and health stressed communities. Carlos also serves as adjunct faculty in the USC Suzanne Dwarak Peck School of Social Work, where he teaches graduate courses in policy, research, and program evaluation and human behavior. Dr. Danielle Rivera is a assistant professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning in the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley. Rivera's research examines movements for environmental and climate justice. Her current work uses community-based research methods to address the impacts of climate-induced disasters affecting low-income communities throughout South Texas and Puerto Rico. Rivera teaches on environmental planning and design, community engagement, and environmental justice. Her work has been published by the Journal of the American Planning Association, Environment and Planning, the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. She holds a PhD in urban planning from the University of Michigan, a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania, and a Bachelor of Architecture from, the, from Pennsylvania State University. Prior to joining UC Berkeley, Rivera taught environmental design at the University of Colorado. Um, and finally, Dr. Marcus Hendricks is an assistant professor of urban studies and planning and the director of the stormwater infrastructure resilience and justice lab at the University of Maryland. He holds a PhD in urban and regional science and a master of public health, both from Texas A&M University. To date, he has primarily worked to understand how social processes and development patterns create hazardous human built environments, vulnerable infrastructure, and the related risks in urban stormwater management and flooding. Other work has focused on technological risks, namely fertilizer explosions and cascading events such as wet weather events that overwhelm sanitary sewers and cause overflows, household backups, and contamination. His work emphasizes participation and action that uses methods, including photography, visual inspection, and environmental sampling. Hendricks's research has been published in several journals, including the Journal of, American Planning Asso of the American Planning Association, Journal of Planning Education and Research, Environmental Justice, Journal of Infrastructure Systems, Risk Analysis, Landscape Journal, and Sustainable Cities and Society. Hendricks has received two early career awards from both the National Acad Academies of Science Gulf Research Program and the JPB Environmental Health Fellows Program at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. More recently, he was named as a 2021 fixer by the media company Grist for their annual Grist 50 fixer list and has been appointed to Springer Nature's U.S. Research Advisory Council the US EPA's Science Advisory Board, and as an author of the Human Social Systems Chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment. We want to thank and appreciate Carlos, Danielle, and Marcus for all being here. Um, and then we'll kind of share the first question in the discussion um, and segue into our, orig our original recording. Um, and that question was, uh, based on your experience, do conventional planning approaches currently used in infrastructure or flood risk resilience planning deliver justice? How do project outcomes fall short of delivering benefits 
and justice to the communities that they are meant to serve. Absolutely, you know, I think, you know, I really want to echo what um, Carlos and Danielle have said immediately by saying absolutely not, right? Um, and I think, in fact, at a high level, including planning, design, engineering, we are absolutely nowhere even close to delivering on justice um, and flood resilience or anything else for that matter. Um, I think we're simply in our infancy of even acknowledging that some human account um, and social phenomena is, is connected to flood risk. Um, and I think, you know, in some of my more recent research, I started to say that, you know, in the practice of floodplain management, capital improvement, public works as institutions and in practice, is unfortunately still more concerned with liability and regulation as opposed to the public good and innovation, which are fundamentally uh, principles to even begin to deliver on justice. And so I think that there is a theory of distance that something is so far in the past or that it's only a matter of correlation and so thus we can't have any sort of contemporary or causal application. And I think a lot of our practice and projects fall short of justice because they first and foremost lack acknowledgement of any discriminatory circumstances, planning, design. Um, they don't plan, design, or install in context at a hyper-local community level with participation of folks that are indigenous to the space. Um, and we also, we, we don't have the foresight to sort of, or, or even if we do, we don't have the, the, the will to sort of put things in place on the front end to ensure not only that there's justice in terms of the initial design, construction, installation, but to ensure justice in terms of proper management over the life cycle of these assets, right? Um, and also to ensure that sort of any, we know, and there's a lot of emerging literature that, that suggests and has demonstrated that any improvement to the built environment, whether it's related to sort of flood mitigation or otherwise runs the, the risk of displacement, right? And so we also have to sort of have that foresight to think about how we mitigate that displacement on the front end as we start to attempt to live up to some resemblance of justice. Wow. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> I'm going to ask one more question and then kick it back over to Alev. Um, so now the question is, what does it mean or what does it look like to use a more community based or participatory approach? And if you have examples from your work, you want to draw from that's fine too. Um, yeah, what is what is more participatory participatory community based approach look like? If I might start Carlos and Danielle, because really, you know, I think. I want to offer sort of a, a set of principles, you know, and sort of the covenant that I sort of go into communities with in terms of, of what does collaboration, what does participation look like in terms of a, a set of ethical principles. And I think maybe Danielle and Carlos can follow with some specific examples, but I think for me and my work, you know, one of the principles that I go into participation and community engagement work it. Uh, is this mindset of, of understanding that um, the return on engagement and participation is a direct reflection of the investment in engagement, right? And so if we don't have item lines and a proper budget um, and resources behind participation and engagement, the quality and level of engagement will reflect that. I also think that engagement has to be you know, in, in order for it to be genuine, it has to be early and often. I think we also have to, and, and I think, you know, Danielle alluded to this, we have to reorient sort of our thinking that the goal of participation and community engagement ought to be community capacity exchange, not community capacity building. Because I think oftentimes we take this top-down approach and go into communities thinking that only we 
as these perceived experts have things to offer when in fact communities are brilliant in their own right and have uh, intuition and knowledge to offer us um, that we can't conceive from our offices and, and laboratories. And so we need to, to sort of recognize that there's an exchange process that takes place, not necessarily a building process. Um, and sort of to dovetail with that, that we the, the goal ought to be to achieve some level of, of cultural humility as opposed to competency. I think even for folks who have started to embark on some of this engagement and participatory work, go in thinking that after the, the, the end of, of a specific effort or initiative, that they're going to be competent in a community that they just engaged with, uh, when in fact, you know, spending a, a limited amount of time in a place that you have no lived experience or historical context is sort of asinine to think that you will become competent in that culture and the things that they have endured over the years. And so we have to humble ourselves in that regard. Um, I think the last few things that I would say is that, you know, relationship and trust building is the foundation of any collaboration and participatory work. Um, the agenda from the very beginning should be shared and mutually developed and adopted. Um, and lastly, you know, I, I think similar to sort of one of my aforementioned points about mitigating displacement, we have to have a secession plan in place um, for sustainable longer term collaborations. Um, and, and I think, you know, sometimes again, we like that foresight in terms of understanding that although we may be promoted or change jobs or move to different places, these communities, you know, ideally, you know, stay the same in terms of as improvement uh, takes place. Um, and so in order to make sure that the institutions that we represent remain engaged, we have to have a succession plan in place and be able to pass the baton and have people to step up, even as we move on in order to, to carry on with those collaborations over time, because the issues don't stop when our budget runs dry or when our project or the fiscal year technically ends. And so we, we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, I'd love to to build on that. I know uh, the question was about examples from our work, but Marcus just presented so many important ideas about, you know, specifically conventional participatory approaches and what needs to change in order for us to actually do this work. And I think it actually is kind of helpful to talk about that and then the examples. Um, and so definitely, you know, building upon what Marcus says, one of the courses I teach is public participation. And I've been really thinking about how conventional participatory approaches run short of what we need them to be doing. And in one way, um, sort of reflecting on what Marcus was just saying, is uh, we need to start questioning this idea of stakeholder within a participatory process. What might it look like if we switch our participatory approaches away from this idea of a stakeholder, which the, even the like grounding of that term comes from uh, this idea of shareholders. And so you can kind of get a sense of how you're thinking of the community in that capacity. Um, what if we just call them partners? And that completely changes the way we think about a participatory process if we're talking about these communities truly as partners. It changes how we approach knowledge production or what kinds of knowledge we're centering and, um, and using. It also changes the way we can start to think about decision making. So um, one of the main issues we have right now in um, sort of dominant modes of participatory processes is um, this issue of reporting back. And this is something I talk to my students about a lot is there are so many resources right now to teach individuals how to do public participation. How do you identify your stakeholder? How, what are the techniques and um, methods that you can use to reach out to communities? But then you get to the end of the process. And I think this is where communities complain the most is that they put all this time in, as Marcus was implying, like if they're going to put all this time into giving you feedback and participating, what are they getting from this process? And that sort of end piece of reporting back isn't happening. And that's because there's a systemic issue in how we're thinking about participation from the start, um, that it's not about communities being truly a part of a decision-making process. Uh, it's not really about centering their knowledge. So right now what we're trying to do is have a completely different way 
of framing participation and participatory processes to center a different mode of understanding knowledge and who is um, who should be centered in these processes, community knowledge being first and foremost. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to to mention all of that because um, I agree with with what Marcus is saying here. Danielle and Marcus, y'all are just hitting it right on. You know, I don't I don't even know where to follow up on that. Um, but what what I will say is, you know, picking up on what you said, uh, Danielle. I mean, it alludes to to um, points that were mentioned earlier too. Is you know this this process, right? Looking at things through a process, justice, equity. Yes, it is an outcome that we want to achieve. It is a goal that we work towards, but it's not. It's not it. It's not the only way. Um, it's not the only way to think about it. We have to really think about equity, about justice as this process, um, and, and it's a process that's really achieved when. Uh, uh, folks that are most impacted by the injustices, right? That they are meaningfully involved in the understanding of the problem, defining what success looks like, uh, um, and doing the work, being involved in the work that it takes to, to, to get there. Um, and that starts not just with folks on the ground, you know, saying, hey, you know, I'm here, uh, I wanna get involved, build my capacity. No, it is really about this, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, agencies, institutions, whether it's government or, or you know, NGOs, uh, nonprofits, of saying, "Hey, we are partners in this, and we are working on a process, right? We're not building capacity on a top down, but it's like, how can we build our own capacity to be able to move along this process together, um, towards equity, towards justice." I'll, I'll give y'all um, some examples or, or, or an example here in LA. Um, you know, we work with, um, uh, I'm with the Council for Watershed Health, and we have this program that started over six years ago. And it's called Redesign LA. And Redesign LA, um, you know, has uh, 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 really was formed out of uh, a needs assessment, a community express needs assessment of, um, you know, saying, hey, there's there's water issues in our communities that we don't understand, but we wanna get involved, right? And there was this gap of like, okay, how do we get folks involved that are addressing hyper-local issues, whether it's um, pedestrian safety, uh, um, um, public health issues, um, how do we get them into uh, 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 the, the water space, right? Um, in, in Los Angeles, um, uh, for those of you who aren't from here, we have had some serious policy changes, right? That are um, uh, that are, are generating billions of dollars worth of resources. So we have multiple measures that we passed just in our county, not even statewide, in our county that is producing billions of dollars in the coming years um, to 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 rebuild our infrastructure. These these are uh, uh, related to parks. Um, to our water infrastructure, um, to transportation. And so uh, with Redesign LA, what we do is we set up this mentor-mentee model. And so we've uh, uh, started with an, uh, an initial cohort um, who took their hyperlocal issues, got trained and understood the language of water, um, understood who, what table, what decision-making tables and bodies are out there. Um, and then we're able to position themselves um, to be at the decision making table and not just about planning, but about implementation. Um, went through some uh, grant writing support, were able to design their own projects, are moving uh, uh, that original cohort are now mentees to new cohorts. Um, and this whole process, right, it's about taking hyper local issues. That these uh, that that groups are 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 working and, and they need to achieve the mission, right? That's what they're working for. But now intersecting it with water, and and looking at ways that um, they can meet these multiple uh, community needs through infrastructure building. Um, and so that process, um, and it goes into a lot more detail, more than we have time here. But that process is really about equity, and it's really about justice, and it's really about uh, um, uh, putting folks on a plain level, uh, uh, um, a level field so that agencies are no longer saying we're the experts and we know 
what needs to happen in this community because this is the water quality that's here. These are the flood risks that are here. This is blah, 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 blah. It's really no. These are our issues. And here's how listen to us. And we are the experts. We are the experts in our community. Um, and here's what we're able to bring to the table. What can you as an agency bring to the table to help us achieve this role? Um, and, and really kind of flipping that, that script. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. But, uh, we're going to pause for a moment on the discussion because we're going to switch closed caption typists. Um, I just want to thank all three of you for um, being so direct and explicit about what is needed. And it seems like a holistically different way from how governments, agencies in general have been used to doing um, work. And it's very uh, very, very insightful, and um, I'm I'm convinced that the governments can do it. <laughs> uh, let me know when our next um, close typist is ready, and then I'll have you go ahead and ask the next question. <clears throat> All right, it looks like she is online. Thank you to our closed captionists. We appreciate your support with us. Um, the next thing that we wanted to ask y'all about, I guess this question is um, specifically for Danielle and Marcus is um, you both do a community based or you both use community based research methods to engage with communities and think about climate and flood risk. Um, can you share a little bit more about your work and what that community based research looks like um, and how you've um, observed that a community driven approach can improve flood risk? Um, outcomes or climate resilience comes for the communities that you've worked with. Danielle, would you like to take it off? Yeah, certainly. So I think um, a really key component about this is, you know, all those things that we were mentioning earlier, that reorientation to community-based knowledge that needs to happen professionally also needs to happen in academia. And all of those issues that I mentioned earlier, not only apply to the professions, but academics are also sort of, um, they also need that reframing and that reorientation. And so that's really what we've been trying to do and um, sort of like to piggyback off the previous questions as well. I think really um, what we're thinking about right now is how Oftentimes when I speak to community members, I, I do a lot of work in South Texas where there's a lot of local issues of flooding um, that aren't very well understood. Oftentimes we think that they're part of sort of the Rio Grande and that system, but actually the flooding issues that we're looking at are actually hyper localized to each uh, rural community that we're working in. And that local knowledge, uh, oftentimes community members speak to me and say, well, I, I know what's happening, but I don't have the engineering or political understandings to frame it in a way that's going to be actionable. And so what we've seen is, well, how do we um, arm community members with the tools so that they're the ones that can then go and speak to their own experience? It's almost like we're trying to work ourselves out of a job. Um, and so what we're trying to do is um, one of my community partners, uh, BC Workshop, they have an incredible initiative that's called Lucha. Uh, it was funded by the Ford Foundation as a pilot and has grown into this incredible initiative. And Lucha is specifically meant to be a way of um, teaching residents in these communities how different systems operate. And so we have a population, many of whom are first generation US citizens uh, or recent immigrants. And so they don't understand how the political system works in Texas. So Lucha arms them with that knowledge, but also there are modules on flooding and disaster. Um, so they can understand exactly, well, why does my community flood? And uh, BC Workshop has done incredible visualizations of why that is. Um, what are these different components of the um, uh, stormwater management system called? So I can actually say where it's failing and how it's failing. And this is really 
um, gotten the community into political spaces. So they've been able to use this knowledge to go to their local county officials and say, you need to start working on this. Um, you need, to, and this is specifically where it's going wrong. And this has provided a lot of momentum for then my group to come in and be able to say, okay, um, we understand that they're experiencing these issues. Well, how do we start to visualize these issues? And oftentimes that's really where I see community-based research methods going is we're just trying to use the tools that we have to help them translate their concerns to a broader audience. And so um, we've done this in a number of different capacities right now. We're trying to understand the scope of uh, flood risk, which isn't actually well documented or mapped in the state of Texas. And trying to just map those concerns is a way of sort of having that call to action. So we're taking that community-based knowledge, visualizing it, and alongside them trying to translate that into some sort of policy or action. Um, yeah, so just a few of the techniques that we've seen that are really important, but always, always centering that community based knowledge first. Sure, yeah, I, I really, you know, I, I agree with Danielle um, in terms of, you know, centering the community is critical to the work that we do. Um, and I think that, you know, the future of, of urban planning, of engineering, uh, of emergency management, floodplain management, um, and, and just science and practice more broadly is increasingly social and participant driven. And I think communities aren't sitting around waiting on us to come and support them um, because they will be holding their breath until they're blue in the face and they're taking, you know, these issues and, and they have been for quite some time um, into their own hands to address issues that they've been facing. Um, and I think, you know, my work started off as you know secondary modeling of infrastructure distribution in terms of you know the inventory condition capacity of systems and what that means in terms of, of flood risk but i almost immediately recognized that that secondary modeling isn't good enough and sort of it falls short of a comprehensive understanding of you know the risk that communities are facing in context likewise i, I think that the way that we typically plan and design and engineer solutions for communities is in sort of this, this perfect state or this perfect world or, or in a laboratory setting uh, almost um, and, and doesn't really recognize that infrastructure systems and these various dynamics operate in, in a social world and are subjected to um, sort of social circumstances. Um, and I think, you know, beyond the, the secondary modeling, I immediately sort of went into communities and said, you know, this is what we think we know per the secondary data and the modeling based off the hydrological modeling, other infrastructure models. This is where we think water might be flowing and where risky areas might be. And communities almost immediately like verified that, yeah, some of this is right, but in other ways it is not so much. Um, in terms of introducing those hyper-local dynamics um, and, and social phenomena of, of illegal dumping that sort of rerouted water in ways that we didn't necessarily anticipate or we couldn't see from the secondary modeling, right? Um, and that's the type of, of knowledge that could really improve and bolster sort of the, the, the work that we're doing both in, in science as well as in practice. Um, my research to date ha has done uh, taken on a number of, you know, participatory projects from, you know, developing a participatory assessment technique for infrastructure by which I mobilize community residents as community scientists to do visual inspection of their stormwater infrastructure systems in the same way that train engineers. Um, visually inspect to, to develop or derive an empirical score ranging from zero to 100, anything 70 and above passing, anything below 70 failing. Um, and, you know, I also recognize that there's a reluctance to embrace community science or community derived data. So immediately after developing that technique, I also engaged some of my engineering colleagues and we set up an experiment by which community scientists train engineers and LIDAR technology uh, 
inspected the same set of infrastructure assets and we were able to empirically and statistically demonstrate that there wasn't a significant difference in terms of the validity and reliability of the community derived data um, next to trained engineers and LIDAR technology. Um, I've also participated um, in sort of grassroots master planning that involved um, flood mitigation and stormwater infrastructure interventions, including green infrastructure. And not only did we sort of develop a master plan that was grassroots and with the community, we also included projections of what it would cost um, initially for construction as well as uh, maintenance and rehabilitation costs if these types of systems were to be installed to give the community context about what it actually looks like from a financial perspective. We also um, modeled and projected the performance of those assets in terms of how much water and flow reduction and, and pollutant load and, and things of that nature might be reduced with the implementation of these types of systems. And so I think from, again, being able to, to inspect the infrastructure assets that provide that first line of defense in terms of, of routing and capturing stormwater runoff to think about what alternative systems might be more impactful and planning for those things in a larger master plan are all critical elements of the work that we do and the ways in which I've engaged communities and um, embraced their participation. Thank you both so much. That really underlines how engaging with communities can bolster our ability to provide, you know, flood risk management to a larger, um, you know, group of the community rather than kind of the limited scope that we might have if we pursue our kind of conventional modeling approaches and our conventional participatory planning or conventional planning approaches as well. Um, something that we wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on is um, the, the idea that um, community driven and participatory planning approaches might actually require more time and money. And this is something that you touched on Marcus, which is these need to be these actions need to be built into budgets. Um, but I guess our question was kind of how you uh, think about that additional time and money investment from agencies. Um, and when they think, when agis, agencies think about kind of where they want to invest um, their resources, how should folks think about, um, I, I guess, where in the planning process should people think about investing that time and energy? And this is a question we'd love to hear kind of all of your perspectives on. Um, maybe I'll shoot it over to Marcus to start. Sure. Um... Yeah, th this is um, <laughs> this is this is a, a timely and a, a touchy topic, especially when thinking about budgets and where funding ought to go or shouldn't go. Um, I think it's made it's you know the the topic of, of what should be defunded versus funded has made another round of circulation in national discourse um, from the recent State of the Union. Um, and, and this is maybe where I say things that, that, that may be perceived as a little bit more or radical, but I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to support communities in terms of flood resilience and justice if we have the will to redistribute resources in ways that make sense, right? And I think in the grand scheme of things, in terms of, of climate change and, and flooding, that public safety in the context of, you know, climate disasters and public health crises that, that you know, that, that's much more of sort of a, an existential threat and crisis to public safety above and beyond, you know, some of the things that we're talking about in, in terms of, you know, lower, lower level human public safety issues. And so I think that there, you know, oftentimes in, in terms of, of municipal budgeting and planning, you know, we, we like to lead with we're strained on resources, but most often I, I think those are, are perceived barriers and limitations. And I think that if we had the will uh, and a motivation to sort of find monies to, to reallocate that, that we could, and, and I think that we should, um, because, you know, 
stormwater specifically in terms of you know this suite of infrastructure assets that we talk about is a stepchild of infrastructure in general and i think even with this historical infrastructure bill that's underway you know in national discourse public media most often the systems that are talked about are, are transportation streets and roadways uh, and i've been consistently frustrated and making the argument that what good is a pristine or a brand new highway or roadway that doesn't have sufficient or adequate stormwater systems that then become impassable or flooded in light of, of a storm event, right? And so, you know, there's an even critical or, you know, even more critical need to sort of not only think about how do we sort of reallocate existing operating budgets toward this, but then also, again, in light of climate change and the fact that stormwater is often sort of buried underground and out of sight and out of mind, how we sort of rally and get that critical mass of support to bring attention to stormwater systems that are long overdue in terms of these huge investments um, in terms of, of new construction, maintenance, rehabilitation. I think that's another thing we don't talk about is that even after this initial bill is spent, what does it look like over the life cycle of these assets in terms of making sure that we're continuously investing in these things? And so uh, financing and, and, and budgets are, are critical, you know, especially in a capitalist system. Money makes that capitalist world go round. I think that there's an abundance of funding and resources that can be redistributed if, in fact, um, there is a will to do it. And I think that there ought to be one. I would even add that there may be, there are existing mechanisms to fund community experts, right? Um, when you are going through a planning process or an implementation process, oftentimes, um, you know, uh, uh, project proponents need to have, you know, need to meet this checkbox. Did you do community engagement, right? That's a task. That is a payable task. That is something that Whoever is that lead proponent, that agency or that developer, um, that firm, they have to check that off, which means they have to spend time and money and resources to meet that requirement. Oftentimes, what we're seeing, right, is that who are seen as the experts are communication firms, our marketing firms, our third party consultants. When in fact, what we could really do is, you know, I, I challenge everyone that's on here who's, who's, uh, who, who, who can who leads projects is to think of your community based organizations, your uh, 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 community groups, your tribes as the local experts and. Pay them for that work, right? Have them uh, a budget line item for them to be able to be part of that process. Um, bring them in so that they can do the community engagement. There's no need for any of anyone to get an outside person firm to try to understand the dynamics of a community, identify who the, the key players are and the community champions are, and then to convince them to have, to host a meeting and to bring people so that you can introduce a plan. Just go directly to the source, right? That's, they're the experts. So thinking of them in that capacity, um, using existing mechanisms uh, to be able to, uh, um, uh, to hire local, to hire them. Um, and, and just very important too, is like looking at tribes, you know, looking at, at, at tribes as, you know, compensating um, tribes and community groups appropriately for, for um, community engagement in, in that expertise. And I guarantee you, it's gonna solve so many problems, right? Um, if as someone, I was reading in the chat, someone said, hey, there is a, the bus um, stop scenario, it's like, they 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 thought that the design what was going to solve the problem was designing the streets when really the problem was that there was no shade and people were across the street with the only tree that was providing shade. That's you know how much money could have been saved if you, they would have hired that local expert, right? All of those planning hours, all of that, you know, just all of that. It's just it, that's all it takes. It's just let's flip our mindset, let's flip the switch and say, hey. Our experts are on the ground. Our experts are community based organizations. Our experts are faith based organizations, um, you know, and, and tribes and 
and just going there. Yeah, I think Carlos and uh, Marcus really answered the question pretty thoroughly. I'd um, just add that um, recently I was participating in a Dignity Institute uh, Symposium on Ethics of Community Engagement, which was led by um, Dr. Destiny Thomas, which is fantastic, uh, great, great resource. I hope she runs it again because uh, one of the issues we talked about, which I, I found very helpful, was this very topic about how do we fund community engagement. And oftentimes when I talk to individuals about changing the ways in which we think about participation, this question of, well, how do we fund it comes up inevitably. And I thought Dr. Thomas specifically in that session had a really uh, positive view of this and answer to this, which is as planners, our number one goal should be social critique. And we can't do the work of social critique if we're not embedded within our communities and understand that community-based knowledge. Um, and so, instead of asking, and I know this is very hard for practitioners, but maybe this is just a challenge, maybe to think about how this could actually start to work in practice, but not see community engagement or participation as sort of an aside, but as part and parcel of what we do. Um, and understanding that regardless of the resources we get, that it's an imperative that we should undertake participation, that some participation, most of it, does require lots of resources and time, but specifically, um, you know, there are others that don't require as much and we need to be very savvy about how we use our resources and our time, very creative. Um, so I thought it's, it's difficult, I understand, to do in practice, but I think it's a really important cause to start taking up. Um, oh, I do see a question about what do I mean by social critique? It means embedding ourselves, not just in labeling the issues that we see in the environment, but how do we elevate those issues to crises is what Dr. Thomas would say. So um, if we see certain things popping up in our communities, what are smaller issues versus those which need to be sort of elevated um, to crises that require more of our time and our resources and our attention. Um, and that has equity implications built into it as well. Um, so social critique is that process of identifying those crises. So in follow up to so much of what you brought up, and I see a lot of comments in the chat, people are curious about the various mechanisms that you have seen or use to pay experts for their time. And so, you know, I heard um, Carlos, you mentioned that, you know, you have to check the box, you have to do the outreach, so pay the locals. Um, I have some thoughts, at least from the Army Corps federal perspective, but I would much rather um, hear, hear from you all if you have um, tips or suggestions or good mechanisms you've seen. <clears throat> Want to start with Carlos? Yeah, so many, so, uh, so folks around counties, agencies, uh, or, or counties, um, states are um, investing a lot more in infrastructure, right? Um, one of the things that we've seen here in LA is the passing of Measure W. Uh, Measure W is a 2.1 cent tax on property taxes, uh, 2.1 cent, cent property tax on impervious surfaces, right? So this is generating about $280 million a year. Um, in, you know, without sunset. Um, so this is 218 million a year to focus on rebuilding our water infrastructure. Now, one of the things that um, uh, uh, we were involved, folks were involved in the coalition um, was to really ensure that there is a mandated percent of return on what here in California are called disadvantaged communities legally, um, but environmentally stressed, uh, um, economically stressed communities, right? So having, whenever there are policies in place, ensuring that there is a mandated like investment return on communities. Um, some of the challenges of just a lesson learned is that, you know, oftentimes we will see, okay, um, because they're downstream, they're going to benefit the investment is going into an area that is not, you know, um, historically underrepresented, but downstream means, okay, they're going to get it eventually. Um, that's just one lesson that we're learning here is that, no, we're, we really want the investment to go where it's needed. 
um, directly. So policy created whenever there's a chance for policy to to set those standards, um, definitely uh, uh, um, it, it should be mandatory. Um, the other thing is that um, there needs to be a process and a mechanism so that community based organizations, faith based organizations, tribal organizations, um, that they are um, uh, 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 that they are in a, on the list, on the consultant list, on the business list, right? Because oftentimes, folks, when you get a project um, going, you have to go through the municipal list, the county list of who's an eligible consultant. So one of the things we I think we we should encourage more and more is making sure that these local experts are on that list and that are listed there so that they um, can be they, they can be sourced and procured. Um, those are just kind of two two mechanisms that I see. Um, in addition to obviously leveraging um, private uh, philanthropic dollars um, with uh, um, with uh, uh, public dollars. I'll pause there and pass the mic. Thanks, Carlos. Danielle. Yeah, definitely. I I think this question of how do we compensate communities for their time is quite multifaceted. I think there are two ways. And one is like the recognition of time that we were talking about earlier. Do communities within the uh, participatory process actually understand their role in decision making or what the information and time they're devoting is going to lead towards? And to me, that's first and foremost. If they can't, if a participant can't see how their time and knowledge is going to actually influence a project or a decision then any other compensation seems kind of moot at that point. And so there's that on the one hand. And then in terms of like other forms of compensation, it's I think really important to remember that that's highly cultural and local. Um, it's important to understand cultural norms around, you know, specifically for specific communities, what forms of compensation would be really key and important. Um, in South Texas, where I do a lot of work, if you hold a community meeting and you don't have at least some food at the meeting, uh, coffee, some pandul say, some people will just up and leave the meeting. <laughs> um, so there's like a there are these cultural expectations um, working in different communities that I think are really important. We don't emphasize enough when we think about uh, public participation and community engagement. Uh, some communities will want you know say gift cards for you know, groceries, if you have a lot of food, um, food security issues within a community, others would want actual just money. Um, and I, so I think this is part of where it is really important to make sure that if you are undertaking community engagement and participation, that you really do have a sense of first and foremost, what is that cultural context that you're trying to operate within before you even start to initiate a process? Because these are things that you need to know up front. Sure, yeah, and, and just sort of to add to that, you know, in all transparency, I, I've been an academic for, for most of my professional life. And so I, I think in practice or, or local municipal governance or state governance in terms of how we compensate communities versus how we do it within academia might be very different. And I think that's the multifacetedness that Danielle is alluding to. And so, you know, speaking from my perspective as, as an academic, I think we compensate communities immediately by sort of committing to long-term partnerships with communities, right? Um, and creating a long-term pipeline and pathway to providing some form of compensation, resources or support to communities themselves or the organizations that represent them. Um, I think, you know, early on in my career with the community that I first engaged with um, on the east end of inner city Houston, the first two years of that engagement process was really me sort of, the, the community sort of testing my commitment in terms of holding me accountable to make sure that it wasn't extractive and that I wasn't dipping in and, and moving out um, and really sort of asking of me to, to do some pro bono writing for them for grants and proposals, right? Um, because I think that's, that's the other key is sort of institution building 
with them and, and for the community so that they then develop the capacity to compensate themselves, right? Um, and so we want the community to be in control of the dollars. And so, you know, again, that first two years and my early work involved just doing some pro bono grant writing. And so, you know, there are a lot of, you know, state and federal agencies that have grant programs and money that 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 has to go directly to community organizations and support and providing support to community organizations and the communities in order to be aware of those grant programs and, and to have the, the resources, skills, technical support needed to go after those dollars. That's a form of compensation. And that's how you start to build sort of institutions within communities. Um, and I, I think the other thing that's emerging, especially, you know, in, in light of, of sort of climate justice and, you know, green infrastructure work is sort of this aspect of, of workforce development, right? Um, as we, you know, embark on this journey of, of greening our communities, um, we ought to be sort of, you know, providing a, a pathway to employment and compensation for the people that, um, deserve to be not only engaged, but involved from a, a workforce perspective, right? And creating those types of pipelines for them to do work in their own communities um, and, and then possibly develop additional training and, and other sort of career enhancement opportunities in that way. And so I see compensation as sort of at the most basic level, compensating people for their time, effort, and energy in the ways that they see fit um, and that is sufficient. Um, but then also sort of, you know, more largely sort of building institutions and support where communities have control over dollars and, and are able to develop budgets and item lines themselves to, again, fund themselves and the work that they would like to see done. Wow. <laughs> Jessica, if I can add yeah. a little bit to this um, conversation yeah. too, is that we, um, you know, because I saw a lot of a lot of um, chats coming in about food and and, and you know um, the the childcare. Um, I think that is definitely great, you know. And and one thing that we also have to think about the workforce development part is if you are if we are able to provide the technical assistance upfront, like we do in, in here in. in Southern California with the Council for Watershed Health. We then position um, our partners, our CBO partners, to be those experts. So, what we, what, what an, an ideal is that no, we're not. There's not. You know, when you get into these uh, plans and, and, and into these projects, don't ask for just a food light on budget, child care line on budget. You are an expert, and you deserve a you know a, a, a consultant rate uh, um, uh, uh, per hour that is like that is going to match your expertise so if a 10 million dollar project is in the works what does it cost like huh, you two hundred thousand to go to that cbo they can hire two staff or whatever it is right they can be they can they can play a significant role that goes beyond just like, oh, let's provide some food for our meeting. It's like, no, hire the local experts, compensate them appropriately. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, so I, I kind of, I do, I do challenge the, that, that perspective that we just need to compensate with childcare or food, um, but really, really seen and compensate folks to hire full-time staff so that they can keep participating in these projects. And just to add one last thing to that, I, I absolutely agree, Carlos. And I think again, that's the that's the very absolutely very least that we can do um, in that regard. Um, but I think you know, we we also need to make sure that um, again that that the the type of compensation is reflective of their expertise and the things that they're contributing and the ways that they see as sufficient. I think when we start budgets, we need to start with the community engagement item lines and the consultation um, fees as opposed to anything else. We need to be advocating within our agencies and institutions for a reduction of overhead. Um, we need to see them as equals. And so, 
Uh, again, what we would pay ourselves for our time, try to match that or get it, you know, incredibly close. And so those are the things that reflect not only compensation, but compensation and, and, and justice, right? Um, and so, you know, again, really appreciate, you know, those remarks, Carlos and Danielle. That, that was an awesome discussion and these are fabulous ideas. Um, for folks who work at the core, a handful of us have been brainstorming to how to overcome our barriers. So if you're at the core, send me an email, we can chat. But um, I want to uh, summarize a little bit and we're just about out of time. So I wanna make sure we get to our last um, two, two questions, which are the action items that we can take away. But I guess I just, for the audience, um, you know, we were just talking about all these ways to engage the community and to pay them. And I just want to reiterate. And when you think about that framework that Alev described earlier on, um, this is not compensating them just to tech, check the box. And why should we compensate them? Just, we have to go through NEPA, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really need their input or want it. It's we do because the outcomes of our projects and programs and et cetera are going to be so much better, so much more equitable if they reflect the input of um, the communities where we're um, building them. So with that, thank you all so much. And I wanna ask each of you to first tell me um, one action that audience members can take today to, to make a change toward this that they can bring home with them and start doing today. And what is one resource you like or would recommend uh, to learn more information? Whoever wants to start can go ahead. Um, so I come from a social work background. I, I'm new to the environmental space, um, public health, housing, re-entry, mental health. And one thing that I am bringing from me from that background is preventative care, right? If we focus on preventative care, we can save tons of money and save tons of complications for individuals, um, health, mental health, substance abuse, housing, economic, any of that. So bringing that to the perspective, so my, my challenge and in, 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 um, to answer the question uh, here is um, something that you can do is just think about that. Think about what is preventative care? How can that be translated? What does that mean to infrastructure planting? What is preventative, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, resiliency mean? What is preventative care in this space? And I think that will get us to think about um, like get community engagement, connect right up front before we get begin uh, the planning phase. Um, so that's the action that I would recommend is just thinking about that. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, I think um, one really clear action is understanding that when we talk about issues such as flooding or disaster um, or you know stormwater infrastructure that oftentimes these are highly, highly technical um, concepts and within these concepts are highly technical um, systems that are at work. And so when we want to engage communities um, understand the issues they're facing or get their inputs on what should happen, that there has to be a translation that happens between what communities are saying and then how does this actually work, you know, in terms of getting a project designed and built or policies changed. And I think that translation is the most important part. Um, and so I think for everyone on the call thinking through, well, how do we center that community knowledge? How do we translate it into things that are actionable or at its best allow communities to learn how to do this themselves? And like we were, we've been really talking about how do we build that capacity in the community so then they can start to do that. Uh, but, but even for me, certain aspects of flooding are still very difficult when we look at hydrology and geology coming at it from the perspective of a designer. Um, and so, I think we need that translation. Sure, yeah, you know, I would encourage folks to, to really start with some reflection and introspection in terms of, you know, asking ourselves, do we, do we even value the people, right? 
and value their perspective because we'll never value their circumstances if we don't value the, the people uh, themselves. And, and I think that that's critically important. Um, I think we also have to check our bias, right? In terms of whether or not the information that we might receive from communities or what they have to offer and, and seeing it as valuable or not. Um, and, you know, I also think that, um, you know, we, we also have to, to consider sort of the, the ways in which, you know, we have historically lacked participation in the outcomes and, and how they were insufficient or inadequate um, and, and think about how much more they could have been improved upon if we could would have, you know, engaged on the front end, you know, through good, high quality um, participation. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I would start with that reflection um, and, and then, you know, move towards, you know, uh, making actions to work in our networks and the people that are being mostly impacted um, and thinking of, about ways how we might ethically gain entree to communities to listen to them um, and understand um, where we might start in terms of addressing these huge systemic issues of flood resilience. Um, and I think, you know, if we start there, you know, it'll go a long way in terms of, again, engaging communities in a meaningful and ethical way. That's awesome. The, the last thing you're on the hook for, Marcus, and then we'll go in backwards order, is what is one uh, resource, either a book, podcast, movie, anything you choose, uh, that you would recommend for the audience to learn something more about what we discussed? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I'll admit now that I'll, I'm going to do a few shameless plugs just because, you know, I've written so much about <laughs> participation, um, especially right. when it relates to, to flooding and infrastructure. But I also want to sort of give attribution in terms of, of the work that my work is building on in terms of, of you know, a classic piece in planning is a piece from Sherry Arnstein, uh, the ladder of citizen participation um, and, and, and how she sort of classifies participation into three categories of, of, um, of non-participation, degrees of tokenism and degrees of, of citizen power. Um, and I think she does an incredible job at critiquing the ways in which um, we historically intend to contemporarily sort of engage communities. Um, and from there, you know, I'm also, uh, I have a, a, a forthcoming piece um, called Moving Up the Ladder and Rising Waters, um, where I'll talk about how we sort of take, you know, Arnstein's ladder and put it in the context of flood resilience and, and flood mitigation. Um, and so I think that's something to, to, to look out for. Um, I've also written a number of pieces about um, the development of my participatory assessment technique for infrastructure um, that could be useful. Um, I also wrote a piece called Leveling the Landscape that outlines uh, the grassroots master planning process that I, you know, undertook with a community. Um, and yeah, I mean, and, and I think that there are a number of other sort of incredible, you know, academics and practitioners that have written about participatory approaches. Um, and so um, I think, you know, just starting, you know, wherever, you know, uh, is palatable for where you are in this work um, will be helpful to moving you along. Great, thanks, Marcus. Danielle? Yeah, definitely. Um, I agree with Marcus, the Sherry Arnstein's piece, Ladder of Part Citizen Participation. There was a recent um, special issue of the Journal of the American Planning Association that celebrated the 50th anniversary of that piece and its influence on planning and uh, public policy. Um, any of those pieces in that issue are absolutely fantastic, and I definitely recommend them. Um, there's one specifically from Santina Contreras, which looks at uh, the latter participation in relation to disasters that might be of interest to some people on the call. Um, and Santina's work on participation and disaster is phenomenal, so definitely check that out. Um, also mention 
Um, the Dignity Institute, which I talked about earlier, is a fantastic resource and it's meant to do this kind of training uh, specifically for practitioners. And so, so many of the resources we have right now are sort of within academia, but the Dignity Institute is specifically reaching out to practitioners to do training on all kinds of axes. Um, in relation to understanding how trauma operates through planning and public policy and how do we undo those systems. And I think um, I didn't really talk too much about how trauma works through <laughs> public participation. That could be a whole other seminar. Um, but um, definitely, I think their resources are really great. Some of their resources are public. So um, definitely take a look at that. Thank you, Danielle. I just posted my favorite it's uh, redesign. Um, and this is um, kind of it'll give it's a resource hub um, for CBOs for municipalities in LA. We have 88. So this is a resource hub that does everything from tracking grants to um, giving examples of, of community engagement, water 101, um, and projects that are community based and community driven community led. So um, it's a good um, it's a good hub that I recommend folks to to, to navigate and spend uh, spend some fun time with. Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Thanks to you all so much. Um, I just yeah, I, I mean if everybody wants to give a virtual round of applause or use the hand thing or whatnot or the the emojis. This has been fabulous and very insightful and there's still over 230 people on the call, even though we're 10 minutes over. So nice job. You've captivated um, a lot of practitioners and you've given us a lot of food for thought, including next steps and introspections on how to move forward for this and how to center justice in our work, delivering more equitable outcomes. And uh, I don't know, I just want a very, very large thank you um, and Alev, do you want to close off <laughs> since this is your day? Yeah, I mean, I just want to echo that. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your expertise and your knowledge. And um, we are so, so appreciative. <laughs> so we look forward to, you know, staying in conversation with you all and any opportunities that we have to learn from your work. We will look out for them and we will share them with folks on um, in our network and on the call today. Great. Awesome. Thanks. With that, we will wrap up. We will share this recording online um, and we look forward to seeing everyone at the next Bridging the Equity Gap webinar. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.